All right, so let's talk about the termination of a listing. We talked about how the contract or how the listing got formed, and we talked about the three types of listing agreements that create agency. And now let's talk about how we terminate a listing agreement. All right. And we have talked about agency in a previous lesson about what terminates agency. Well, since agents, agency is created by the listing, the same things that terminate the agency will also terminate a listing. All right. So most notably completion of the listing. If you actually sell the property, you have closed, you have terminated that listing. If there is a breach in the listing agreement, if the seller or the agent perchance actually breaches their obligations that are set out in that listing contract and one party breaches it, then that listing contract can actually be voidable and canceled. You can have a mutual agreement to terminate a listing. Now, the key here is the word mutual. You both must agree. And remember, it is a contract and anybody can agree on anything as long as it fits the definition of a contract if both parties agree. If your seller says, I don't like the shirt you're wearing and you say, I don't like the way you've parted your hair, let's terminate this listing and both parties agree to it, then that is perfectly fine and you can terminate that listing under a mutual agreement. Remember, I said anybody can do anything as long as both agree. I have in several cases not agreed when the seller has said, I want a mutual release. No, you're under contract. I had an open house this weekend. I had three people come through. I had one agent said he was potentially going to write an offer. I am not going to release you yet because I want to see if my open house was fruitful. Now, there could be all kinds of problems and I understand that mutual is supposed to be voluntary, but trust me, I understand how the real world works. And there have been situations where sellers have asked for a release and then all of a sudden you say no. Now you call them and go, hey, I've got a showing. And they go, oh, well, I can't show it today. Grandma's in town. Laundry's all over the house. So they can make it really hard to the point where you then go, okay, let's just release. So while it is mutual, either party can say no. Typically, it's hard to hold someone's feet to the fire on a situation like that. It could have an expiration. And let me back up. I just misspoke. It must have an expiration it, because we are not allowed to have perpetual listing agreements. So there has to be a start date and there has to be an end date on your listing agreement. Okay. Now let's talk about one other thing here real quick in that there is this thing called the broker protection clause. All right. The broker protection clause. What this is, it is a blank inside of the listing that allows you to put a number in that says, hey, for seven days past the listing, anybody that would have been my client, actually I get credit for as well. So let me explain. Suppose Sunday you have an open house and a guy comes in and says to your open house, Hey, I want to buy your listing. Let me go home and get my wife. We'll be right back. Monday, your listing expires. Tuesday, he comes back into your office and says, Hey, I'm sorry about Sunday. I got home. My wife wasn't feeling good, but I'm here right now to buy the house. And I got a cash full of money. I want to buy this house close in three days with cash. What do you do? Well, under the expiration, your listing expired right here. But because we have this broker protection clause, 
that says for seven days past the listing, anybody that would have been my client during the listing is also my client after the listing. Unless one of two things occurs. Unless they decide they don't want to sell. So you call them up Tuesday and go, hey, I'm sorry, I know the contract expired yesterday, but I've got a buyer that's sitting here that wants to buy your property. And they say, well, we've decided that we are not going to sell after all. So thank you, but no thanks. That would not allow you to keep that as a client because they are not actively selling the property. Or the second thing that could happen is if they relist with another agent. Both of these cancel your broker protection clause. So you call them up on Tuesday and go, hey, my contract expired yesterday. I've got a buyer sitting in my office. Do you still want to sell? And they say, yes, we do. But we just re-signed with a new agent. And matter of fact, they're just now pulling out of the driveway. So it's listed already with someone else. In this case, you are totally hosed because they are not selling. In case number two, you could, you're only partially hosed because they've already relisted, which canceled your broker protection clause. But in fact, you actually still have the buyer who's sitting in your office with that bag of cash. So you call the new listing agent and go, hey, dude, uh, shortest listing of your career because I got the buyer sitting right here. All right. So that broker protection clause is in there so that in case this scenario happens. Now realize it only protects people that would have been your client during the listing. If there is a new person that walks into your office on Tuesday and says, hey, I was going to go to your open house Sunday, but my wife was sick. We never showed up. I am here today. This person is not covered under the broker protection clause because he never came to me during my listing time frame. This person's covered because if he would have written the offer Sunday, it would have been my client. So understand that the broker protection clause only protects people that would have been your client during your agency time frame. People outside of that are not covered under the broker protection clause. So you've got to have that expiration. Now here's another topic that deals with expiration that I've had just recently. Let's look at this. People have often asked, do I have to write a new offer or can I amend the old listing? And the answer is most definitely yes. Now remember, I am not a practicing attorney, but here's what several attorneys have talked to me about. If the property has expired, all right, here's Sunday, Monday it expires. Tuesday, you go back out and say, hey, our contract expired yesterday. Do you want to relist? And they say, yes. In a situation like this, where you go in after the contract expires, I have been told that this is the one you need to do because you cannot amend an expired contract. It is done and over. However, if you would have went in on Sunday and said, our contract expires tomorrow, can we push the expiration date out another six months? And they say, yes, you would want to or could amend that current listing to change the date from expiring on to February, and we're going to change it to now expires here. All right. So understand that if the contract is still in place, you can amend a contract. If the contract has expired, you probably should write a new one. Okay. So that's what I have been told by several practicing real estate attorneys. Now, when in doubt, just write a new contract. The, the writing of a new contract also allows for changing of other terms 
Whereas an amendment, if there are multiple things you want to change, could get messy. For instance, he may say, yeah, I want to sign a, uh, uh, an extension, but I want to lower the commission, or I now want to remove the washer and dryer that was going to stay. We've now decided to take it. Well, you start writing an amendment with four, five, six changes, it might be more beneficial just to write an entirely new contract that picks up when this one expires. You could have the old one and then the new one going here. All right. Uh, what else? An act of law like bankruptcy. That's going to terminate a listing. You don't want to hear your client ever say BK because that is going to be a problem for you. Death. That's death of either party. Now, here's the key. That's death of me, the managing broker, not you, because they are not your listings. Remember the pelicans from Finding Nemo? Mine, mine, mine. It's my listing, my client, my commission, all of that. If you were to be involved in an accident and, God forbid, pass away, I would still have that listing. I would just reassign it to a new agent in the office because the listing is with me. So this death right here is the death of the managing broker or the client, not necessarily you. And the last one that would terminate a listing would be the destruction of the property. If the property were to burn down, or get torn up by a tornado. Obviously, if there's no property there or no physical structure, then you can't list that property. You may have to relist it in a different manner. Hey, it was a 6,000 square foot home. Now it's just four acres of land. <laughs> okay, so these seven things will terminate that listing. And those are the key items that you need to keep in mind. Now, we will discuss this death further a little later on because it is important as when you get into a managing broker and the 24-hour managing broker course that we will go through the whole reason you create a corporation or an LLC or a partnership is to avoid this potential issue of the quote unquote, and I'm using finger quotes, the managing broker dying. All right. If there's a corporation involved and they become the managing broker, then that managing broker didn't die. Oh, Raymond died, but his uh, LLC didn't. So you will see a little more in-depth discussion when you take the 24-hour managing broker course on why you should probably establish a corporation to potentially take this whole issue out of the potential realm. All right. Now we often get a question. What's the difference between a breach and a mutual agreement? Because under breach it is not necessarily mutual. If a party breaches their fiduciary responsibility that is delineated inside of the listing contract, that could in fact make the contract voidable and not be in force anymore. So for example, let me give you one. Let's say you list a property with somebody and you go out and they sign the listing and all of that. And after they've signed the listing, they say, oh yeah, and by the way, we don't want you to sell it to any of blank people and insert any kind of uh, FHA violation that you can think of. That would be a case of they are breaching one of the clauses in our listing that says we must abide by the fair housing rule. That is a case of, I do not need his permission to cancel this contract because he has breached it. All right. If the seller will not allow me to show the property, I have literally had this before with a buddy of mine that was a landlord who I was trying to sell one of his rental properties. And every time we called the tenant to schedule a showing, the tenant always said, oh, grandma's in town, um, but didn't put the dog away and we could never show the property. So I finally called David. And I'm like, David, dude, look, I can't show this property. 
I'm spending a lot of marketing money, a lot of effort, a lot of time fielding phone calls, and you are not upholding your end and allowing us to show the property. You are in breach of our listing agreement. I'm going to go ahead, send you an email explaining this and terminate the listing. You need to explain to your tenant what's going on and things of that nature, either evict them, terminate the lease, wait till the lease is over, explain that they are going to stay, whatever. But as of current, you are in breach of the contract. All right. A mutual agreement literally has to be mutual between the parties. And typically a mutual agreement is not based on a violation of one of the rules. All right like that mutual agreement can be hey i've decided that i really am going to stay here and not sell i really like to remove uh, my house from the mls and you say okay i agree with that i understand so we will mutually release and there is an affirmation and a document that we sign called the mutual release of listing and therefore it is voluntary both parties enter into it and they acknowledge it and sign it. And then that goes into the file as a mutual release. All right. So there are definitely differences between what is called a breach and what is called a mutual release. Now, there have been times when a party has breached the contract and I have called them and we amicably agreed to mutually release rather than go through this whole, I'm going to send you a letter and terminate the listing myself. So that happens a lot. So don't be confused that you can use a mutual release or a mutual agreement as the mechanism when someone breaches. You don't necessarily need to go through all of the, I'm going to file a document and send you an email and disclose all of that. Um, literally, that's what David and I did. I mean, he was a friend of mine and he was in breach of the contract. We ended up signing a mutual release just to make it real easy. And we agreed and he agreed, hey, I'll bring the listing back to you when I solve this issue. Now, now that I think about it, it never came back to me. So I think I got screwed on that. I'm not sure. What are your responsibilities after the termination of that listing? Well, remember, you got those six fiduciary obligations that you have to have. We've got the care of the obedience, the loyalty and disclosure, but afterwards we still have the accounting issue and confidentiality. These two remain after you terminate your listing because the agency requires that these two stay in perpetuity. Now, the one thing about confidentiality that can change is if something you knew in confidence now becomes public knowledge, then technically it's not in confidence anymore. For instance, your seller says, I want to sell because of bankruptcy, but don't tell anybody I'm trying to work it out. That would be something that you would keep in confidence. However, if something happened and they failed to keep it a secret and they had to file, which becomes public record, and it was in the newspaper under the legal section, and now the bankruptcy is declared that they're going to have to go to sheriff sale. Potentially that information that you knew in confidence then may not be confidence now. So in essence, it's now public knowledge. You may be able to now go find a buyer and say, Hey, let's write an offer on this because this guy's in bankruptcy or foreclosure or getting a divorce, <coughs> whatever the issue. If that confidence statement now becomes publicly known, then it's no longer in confidence and this responsibility may not be there. All right. So hold on. We'll come right back.